Would you stand with me? <coughs> Becky, would you please come? I'd like her to reread this because it's so fitting. In fact, I, I, I thank everyone, my wife and uh, Brian, for being sensitive to the Holy Ghost. Uh, you'll see how God is just saying something here. It helps me when I sometimes wonder, am I tuned in? And then I come here and everybody's saying the same thing. It helps me. So listen carefully to these verses again. O oh Lord, you are my lamp. The Lord lights up my darkness. In your strength, I can crush an army. With my God, I can scale any wall. God's way is perfect. All the Lord's promises prove true. He is a shield for all who look to him for protection. For who is God except the Lord? Who but our God is a solid rock? God is my strong fortress. He makes my way perfect. He makes me sure-footed as a deer, enabling me to stand on mountain heights. He trains my hands for battle. He strengthens my arm to draw a bronze bow. You have given me your shield of victory. Your help has made me great. You have made a wide path for my feet to keep them from slipping. Thank you. And now I'll go to... Uh, my text in John chapter 1. The title of my sermon this morning is Shining Light. Shining Light. You know, life was designed to be a challenge. Anybody notice that? It's a mountain to climb. It's a road to hoe. It's a beast to tame. Um, and if you just look at raw nature, it teaches us that. I, I watched a documentary on zebras a while back. And man, just, just to live to be a ripe old age of, as a zebra is like impossible over there in Africa. It's, it's that they, uh, they ha- they're born and actually if, if a zebra becomes pregnant and then her uh, leader is killed and a, a new male takes over the pack, he'll wait until that baby's born and kill it because it's not his own. So first you have to survive your dad. And then you have, to, you have to survive the weather. And then you have to survive the lions. And uh, you have to survive the, your own herd. And then you have to cross rivers with alligators. And life is just hard to survive all by itself. I was uh, doing some yard work at our new house. And uh, out there working around some trees. And there were vines that big around that had almost killed some of the trees. Just life is that way. If you sit still for a while, something's going to entangle you. If you get involved in something you shouldn't, after a while, you're strangled by it. Something has to come set you free. Things, life is a struggle. Uh, just on a personal note, just so you, every once in a while, some of you tell me that it's good for me to share stories so you know I'm human too. Uh, we, we did buy a new house, and we, we sold the old one. Had, we are hoping to have some cash to put into the new one, and that has happened. But uh, some of that cash kind of went away this week because uh, we were pulling into a service station and getting some gas, and the guy told us we had a leak. And so uh, we, we tried to get it checked out. We went to the dealership, and they found out there was just a simple little plug in the engine block. It was leaking. It cost, I think, eight ninety five. But in order to put it in, they were going to have to pull the transmission. And the labor was going to be $1,700. So I needed new tires, and I needed some other work done, an air-conditioned charge, and it had, <clears throat> it had well over 100,000 miles, 120-some thousand miles on it. So oh, we decided to buy a new vehicle. It's nice to have a new car, but now I don't have that money to work on other things. Life, life is a struggle. You think you're going to go somewhere, you, you get a break, and you think you're going somewhere, and then you hit, you hit this wall, and it's like, and I'm not complaining to you, I'm just saying that's life. And you, you often look around and say, I wish I had their life. You don't know what they're dealing with. You ought to just wish you have God to go through life with, because... 
the truth is, if I hadn't sold the house, I wouldn't have had the money to buy a, a car. And God was taking care of me. It just didn't happen the way I thought it was going to happen. Not only is our natural life uphill, but we have an enemy who's doggedly seeking to put your light out. And the more people he is able to affect in a culture or in the world, now we have a world uh, system, we have a we have such a small world that the whole world is going to hell in a handbasket together. Instead of a country going down, the whole world is being affected. The more people that the enemy can affect, the more pressure that puts on you. So the fact of the matter is, he's got your number and he's trying to put your light out. Now what do we do with that? Whine and complain and crawl in the corner and cry and... Shake our fist at God. How, how do we deal with that? Well, John begins his gospel very simply, and he really capsulizes life when he says, in the beginning was the Word, capital W, that means the Logos, that means God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and that life was the light of men, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Shining light. Let's pray. God, I pray that you would help everyone in this room to leave here with new strength and new perspective. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to hearts. I pray that you would change perspectives. I pray that you would encourage and inspire and direct. You would continue to speak into the lives of these people in Jesus' precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Darkness. Uh, I, I told you about the time my wife and I were on our honeymoon and we went to Carlsbad Caverns and they took us how many ever hundred feet down in the ground and then they turned the lights off and they asked you to try to see your hand and you can't even see your hand before your face. That, that's darkness. And that's kind of neat when there's a switch over on the wall. But if you were actually down in there with no light, that's another story. It, for us, if your electricity goes out, it's inconvenient. You know, for early man, Adam and Eve, when it was nighttime and the, the moon wasn't out, they were just stuck. They, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't get their flashlight and go looking for something. So how do you deal with the darkness? How are we supposed to handle that? If you're in a dark room and you want to see something, do you blow the darkness out? Do you swat it? Get it out of the room that way? Do you, do, do you grab a fan and try to push it out the window that way? Or do you, do you curse at it? Or, or do you freak out, scream, go on the floor? Do you, do you yell real loud? Do you get drunk? Does any of that get rid of the darkness? There's only one solution to darkness. And that's light. Now, our world is bad. I agree. And in fact, I call attention to it sometimes because God called attention to it. The Word of God called attention to it. But I look around sometimes and it's just disheartening to see the darkness in mankind. I'll give you a few examples. Uh, I, I, I like to build a little shed. So I was looking online for pictures of sheds, wood sheds. I just wanted some pictures so I could decide what kind of woodshed I want to build. And up come all this pornography and abusive kind of things just because I'm Googling woodshed. It's, it's a sick, sick world that we live in. There's darkness out there. So what am I going to do today? Molly Grubb, do I get up here and talk to you all day about how horrible it is, about the, all the pornography and all the abusive things? No, that's not going to solve anything. I feel my heart is heavy for people. Why would you, uh, why would you let yourself be taken a picture of in, in all these weird kind of situations and then plastered all over the web? Why would you do that? Uh, my wife and I did our outreach. We went to fireworks and uh, we, uh, we were trying to maybe connect with people, but it, there was such a disconnect from us and them. Uh, most, half of them were drunk where we were at. 
and there was loud music playing there, and there were little four and five and six year olds running around, but the music had the worst curse words you could use in it, and they were just thumping away and singing. These kids were just right there listening to, uh, you know, all this blankety blank, blank, blank stuff in the songs. And I'm thinking, what a dark world we live in. I get discouraged when our Supreme Court goes the way of all great civilizations and they start making ruling, unjust rules. They, they start going against the Word of God. The, the Bible has some of the harshest words to say against unjust judges. And they're going to answer for that. They may have gotten their way, they may have passed, but the, the men who did not stand for righteousness and decency will have the blood of millions of peop- children on their hands. Messed up lives will be on the hands of those Supreme Court justices who, who varied from God's rules and tried to make their own rules. Darkness. I, I, I'm surprised at how politicians nowadays are even getting up and making stump speeches about immorality, telling people, I'll, I'll make immoralities moral if you'll vote for me. They're getting votes by saying, I'm willing to be unrighteous. That's darkness. Our politicians are also, not just politicians, but there's, there's been a fanning of flames of hatred and division in our nation. And, and we, we, all, we always had problems, but now if we can get the rich against the poor, if we can get races to go against one another, if we can get men to go against women, if we can get straight to go against gay, it's, everywhere you look, people are fanning the flames and, and they're making it darker and darker and darker. What are we supposed to do with all of that? As a church, what are we supposed to do when we see everybody doing everything so ugly in our world? What do we do? What did Jesus do? Jesus simply... Turn the light on. Turn to your neighbor and say, turn the light on. Just turn the light on. Yeah, but how are we going to fix the Supreme Court? It's not your business. You're not their parents and you're not their God. Just turn the light on. Well, how are we going to deal with all these people in our community that are, are bad? Well, we, we do have laws, but e- even our laws, especially when the courts get messed up and when, when justice systems get messed up and all the corruption gets in there, there's, there's no solution that's going to fix America except the hearts of men and women being changed. There's got to be some light turned on in that life and that life and that life and that life. The only way the city gets a victory over darkness is thousands of lights to come on. That's why instead of us going and fighting Washington, we just need to go next door and turn a light on in our neighbor's house. We just need to go to a, a, a friend and turn a light on in their life. Turn a light on. A shining light. Jesus turned a light on. He, he was in a dark Roman world. I'll talk a little bit more about this later. It was an ugly place. It was a putrid place society. It was just as rotten as America is today. It's just as rotten as Hollywood is today. It was a horrible place of abuse, of darkness, of immorality. Jesus didn't go to Rome, start a movement. He didn't start a new chapter called, you know, uh, Galileans against pornography. He turned a light on. He just went and started healing the sick and raising the dead and blessing who he can bless and, and preaching the gospel and speaking the truth. And he, he took a lot of heat for it. But that light just grew and grew and grew. Men uh, stayed wicked. In fact, some men got even more powerful, but that light just, it just kept going and eating up that darkness. And now most of the world has heard about Jesus. Most of the world couldn't call the names of the men who were powerful and wicked when he was alive. He turned the light on. We, as human beings, have been given life, but we've been given more than just human life like the frog. I, I know not everybody believes this, but, you know, your, your dog does not have an eternal soul. 
I may have just ruined my sermon there for some of you, but when Jesus, when, when God got done creating dogs, He did not breathe into them the breath of life. But when He got done with you and me, that's why we're not supposed to act like animals. We have more than a natural life. We have a spiritual life. And that life is the light of men. That's eternal life. He breathed into me eternal life. Everlasting life. And I want to make sure that I, I get that everlasting life into the right kingdom. Because I'm going to live forever somewhere. Somewhere I'm going to live for. He gave me everlasting life. And I choose in my little period of time that I'm alive, I choose which kingdom am I going to live forever in. God doesn't send anybody to hell. God says, I'm giving you everlasting life. You can live it in heaven or you can live it in hell. I'm not going to make you go either way. You choose. But you can't just stay where you're at. You're going to die. Every man will die. And after that's the judgment. God doesn't send anybody to hell. He gives everybody everlasting life. They, they just decide, do I, do I have my everlasting life in His kingdom or do I have an everlasting life outside of His kingdom? So I want to just read four scriptures very quickly to remind you of this principle and to, to remind you this is not my theory. This is Jesus' teaching and Paul's teaching. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 10 and this is from the message paraphrase. But we know it now, since the appearance of our Savior, nothing could be plainer. Death defeated. Did you say death defeated? Death defeated. Say life vindicated. And a steady blaze of light. All through the work of Jesus. Jesus came and He, by His life, made it plain. He defeated death and He vindicated and gave us a steady blaze of life. John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spake to them, saying, I am the, what? Light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 14 and 6, Jesus said unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then John chapter 6, verse 44 from the Amplified Version. Not one is able to come to me unless the Father who sent me attracts and draws him and gives him the desire to come to me. And then I will raise him up from the dead at that last day. God not only gave me this natural life, but he gave me this eternal life. And when my natural life is over... He's either going to rapture me or he's going to raise me up out of the grave. And he, he gives me that everlasting life. Now, this is the good news. It's kind of hard to give people good news when they have it so good. You know, you have it probably gooder than most people in the world. You're in one of the richest countries in the world. You're in one of the most comfortable uh, church situations compared to all the churches around the world. You have one of the most comfortable places to come worship Jesus. You're going to go home and you're going to eat a meal probably, probably too much. Most of you probably have to lose weight. That's how good it is. Right? So when I come to you and say, good news, blessings and light... And you, you have so many lights in your house. You know, you have 40, 50 lights in your house. It's like, oh, yeah, that's nice to have a light. You haven't been without enough lately to appreciate it, maybe. The good news is that Scripture says darkness can't put this light out. God has given me light. God has given me life. God has given me His Spirit. God has given me eternal life. And the devil himself can't take that away from me. The devil can't kill me. The devil can't send me to hell. The, my, my neighbors can't change my eternal destiny. My, my Supreme Court cannot change my eternal destiny. Uh, all the wickedness that's happened in, uh, in Hollywood cannot put this light out. I, I, I've got a hold of something that nothing... Nothing can take out, 
But I need to value that. Instead of looking and worshiping the darkness, I need to realize the power of the light that He's given me. Jesus walked into a very dark world and He changed it. The disciples turned the world upside down because they understood light wins. Light is victorious. Let me prove it to you. Let's look again at that fifth verse from John chapter 1. I'm going to read it from four translations just so you can get a good picture of this. Start again with the King James. And the light shineth in darkness. Where's the light? In the darkness. Where's the church? In a dark world. We're supposed to be a light not under a bushel. And the darkness comprehended it not. Now, it's not like the darkness is up there trying to understand it. Uh, so let's read a couple other translations to understand what that really means. The Amplified says it this way. And the light shines on in the darkness, for the darkness has never, would you say that word? Never. Overpowered it. Put it out, or absorbed it, or appropriated it, and is unreceptive to it. In other words, light rules. God created an earth and the enemy made it dark and God sent light through people and through prophets and through the law and finally he robed himself in flesh and the light of the world stepped into the world and that light turned... Uh, turn that darkness aside. The, the darkness could not handle it. The worst Herod killing babies couldn't kill Jesus. Pilate making a bad decision couldn't kill Jesus. The bad religious leaders couldn't kill Jesus. It's only when Jesus laid down His life that He died and He paid the price for the sins that you and I have. This darkness has never over, overpowered life. I need to tell myself that. When I look at the darkness, when I look at my neighbors, when I look at people who were in church and left church, my heart can be heavy and I can start fearing and I can start worrying about all this darkness. But there's no value to that. There's no hope in that. There's no joy in that. There's no direction in that. Instead, I need to turn back to the, to the philosophy Jesus lived by. He, he lived in a horrible world just like you do. He, he was a poor man just like many of you may be. But that darkness did not stop him. The New Living Translation says it this way, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. I don't care how ugly it gets. I don't care how dark America gets. I don't care how bad we slip into immorality. This light, this good news, this truth that I have will never be extinguished. It doesn't matter what laws are made. It doesn't matter how politically incorrect it gets. It doesn't matter if they take my tax exemption away. That light will shine in the darkness and the darkness will never, never, ever extinguish it. I'm on the winning side. Hallelujah. The message paraphrase says it this way. The life light blazed out of the darkness and the darkness could not put it out. That's who I'm following. I'm following in the footsteps of Jesus who he didn't even worry about the darkness. He was just that light bulb moving through the darkness. And every, everything around him got blessed. Everything around him got healed. Everything, everything that wanted to respond to the goodness of him like touching the hem of his garment. It, goodness happened. Everybody who wants to be filled with the Holy Ghost is going to get filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't care how many false doctrines or traditions of men are out there. This light will not be put out. This truth will not be stopped. You and I just have to flow. We have to decide, hey, I'm just going to turn the light on. I'm not going to hide it under a bushel. I'm not going to consider the darkness. I'm just going to shine. I'm going to shine. The darkness can't put it out. Don't give the darkness so much credit. That leads to depression. When I sit around and think about well, what if I die? Or what if, my, my, what if arthritis gets worse? Or what if I get skin cancer? Or what if my lungs start to fail? Well, what if? What if I die? I've got eternal life. I've, I've got a life 
that is beyond the grave. I got a life that's beyond arthritis and, and, and sugar and all, all, all the kinds of things, cancer and all the things that can happen. Me. Uh, th- that's all darkness. That's all death. That all happened because of sin. But Jesus came and he started a fire. He's a light that says, you know what? Even if you die of disease, you're going to go to a place where there is no more disease. Even if you live in a place of darkness and sin, I'm going to take you into a kingdom where there is no darkness and where there is no sin. All you need to do is keep burning. Don't give the darkness so much credit. And, and here's something that I have to tell myself. Don't feel responsible to fix the darkness. And that's hard as a pastor because I see people make choices and go to dark places. You know what? That's their choice. I can't make their choices for them. And I can't stop people from making bad choices. And if I put all my energy in trying to do something I have no control over, the enemy gets me sidetracked with, I can be depressed. My job is to get up here and make sure I'm preaching the Word without fear and favor, that I'm, I'm speaking truth, that I'm laying hands on the sick, that I'm my little world, right? All I control is right here. I, I don't even control my wife. I don't control my kids. I don't control anybody here. All I can be is that vessel, that, that fountain. All I can be is this little hose right here. And if I can speak the truth today, maybe somebody will get help. But I can't do anything. Anything about what you're going to do with this sermon today. I can't make one bit of difference in your family if you choose to ignore the truth that God gives to you. I can't fix your relationships. I cannot forgive a bit of sin. I cannot drag you down here and make you repent. I, can't la- I cannot lay hands on you and fix you of adultery. I can't do that. So I'm not going to worry about your adultery unless God tells me to speak into your life like Nathan spoke into D- David's life. If he tells me to, I'll point my bony finger and I'll say something, but not because I'm better than you, just because if God wants to speak to you, I'll do that. But I can't make you stop doing what you're doing wrong. And, and as a pastor, that, that gets to be a heavy load because sometimes God shows me things or things come to light. And after a while, I'm so worried about the darkness that I'm heavy. And I have to go back to this. Wait a minute. They can put the light out in their life, but they can't put the light out. They can keep the light from shining in their situation. They can choose immorality. They can choose to not be submitted. They can choose to mess up their family. They can choose to do whatever, but they can't choose to to put this source out. They cannot make truth anything different than it is. They cannot make God anything different than he is. They they can't make the spirit any different than he is. I I, I have light and I'm just going to let that light shine. I'm going to let it be a fountain. I'm going to let it flow. A shining light. Jesus is the solution. Now we can sometimes forget how dark it was before the light, can't we? And sometimes we coast on yesterday's light. Sometimes we, the battery's still running. It's a little dim and a little dimmer, a little dimmer. But, but there's some people, you only see them every so many months because finally they hit bottom and decide they better go get recharged. So they live in half darkness most of their life. They live a low quality life because they don't keep it hot. They don't keep it vibrant. They don't keep a good connection. They don't keep a good flow of light in their life. And then they wonder why they're sickly and they wonder why they can't sleep. And they wonder why they're having family problems. Some people skate by on other people's light. They're feeling depressed. They come to church and there's 30 people that are tuned in worshiping. They feel angels and they feel the flow of the Holy Ghost. And and it's like, this is awesome. All they're doing is they're sitting in other people's light. I I have a little solution to those of you who might not really feel a great... A great deal of joy and happiness because you have this light. If, if lately you have not really valued what you have, go to a funeral of a non-Christian. Better yet, I'll let you preach the next funeral that someone asked me to preach that's a non-Christian. Or you have to stand in front of the family of somebody who didn't know Jesus. Try to give them comfort. 
That's when you appreciate the light. Or, or here's another idea. Go get a, a home Bible study. and Go to a home where there's no light, where a, a, a complete non-Christian asks you to come teach them. Go sit down in their world and hear the yelling of the kids and the family and, and feel the heaviness and, and see the addictions. And, and then you'll start appreciating again what light you do have. Some of us are so blessed we got so many lights on in our life, so many blessings. God, He's healed our body. He's healed our emotions. He's saved our soul. That if, if we get a traffic ticket, that's depression for us. We don't have a clue what some people are going through. Jesus turned the light on in a very dark world. Let me remind you of how dark His world was. Take the religious leaders of the world. I'm going to read from historians on two men, Annas and Caiaphas. Annas and Caiaphas were related. They were the high priests kind of running things during Jesus' life. And Annas actually served from 86 to 8015. Uh, this is what Eder, Eldersheim says in the Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, Volume 2. Annas was enormously wealthy and was able to furnish his friends in the praetorium with large sums of money. The names of these bold, licentious, unscrupulous, unscrup degenerate sons of Aaron were spoken with whispered curses. Annas owned the famous bazaars of Annas, which controlled the sale of animals for sacrifices and the money changers at the temple. The messiahship of Jesus was a threat to their enterprise. Annas and his family made the temple a marketplace and a den of thieves. Remember, Jesus turned the tables upside down. That's why Annas was mad at him, because he was going to hurt the pocketbook. Now, William Hendrickson says this about those men and about Caiaphas especially. Greedy, serpent-like, vindictive Annas ruled, excuse me, rude, sly, hypocritical. Caiaphas, crafty, superstitious, self-seeking pilot, and immoral, ambitious, superficial Herod Antipas were the judges of Jesus. You had Annas, Caiaphas, Pilate, and Herod, all major jerks. But they couldn't touch Jesus. They couldn't have beat him. He could have walked through the crowd then, just like he did before, if he would have wanted to. He was the light. He knew he was the light. He, he put up with those ugly things in the world, but he didn't let Annas run his life. He didn't let Caiaphas run his life. He didn't let the president run his life. He didn't let the Supreme Court run his life. He didn't let the governor run his life. He didn't let his mother-in-law run his life. Are you getting my point here? He didn't let anybody else in all their cruelty and all their ugliness and all their crookedness. So you got arrested falsely sometime. Well, you know what? That happens. There are bad cops and there are bad preachers and there are bad uh, hairdressers. What do you do? Stay home and not go eat pizza because there's bad pizza makers? What are you going to do? Be bitter at the whole world because one day you, you, somebody mowed your lawn and threw a rock through the window and they didn't pay for it, so now you hate everybody who runs lawnmowers? It doesn't really make sense. That's how darkness comes in. I, I have to realize there's bad people all over the place. Jesus knew there were bad people all over the place. He, he, he spoke to it every once in a while, but Jesus didn't crawl in a hole and complain that Annas was bad and Caiaphas was bad and Pilate was bad and Herod was bad. Jesus just boldly walked about doing his thing, letting light shine in darkness. He outlived them all. He outshined them all. He, he changed the kingdom. That's how we're going to change New England. Not by all of us getting together and complaining about how bad it's getting in New England. Not by everybody crying in their milk and saying how horrible their neighbors are and how immoral it's getting. But we shine in a dark world. We shine in a place that's ugly. Shining light. Herod Antipas. Let me just tell you a little bit about Herod. He was known as the Tetrarch of Galilee. He was the second son of Herod the Great. Herod the Great was the guy who had Jesus, tried to have Jesus killed when he was a baby. This man was educated in Rome, and he had kind of gotten a taste for that immorality and all the, thing, the vices of the Romans. He was spoken of as superstitious, fox-like. Jesus even called him a fox. 
fox-like in his cunning, and wholly immoral. His first wife was named Artis, and uh, excuse me, was the daughter of Artis. He was the king of Arabia. But he sent her back to home uh, because he wanted to marry Herodias, who he had seduced in Rome. He was married to one woman. He went and seduced another na- named Herodias. This woman that he seduced was the daughter of his half-brother, so it was his niece. But at the same time, she was the wife of another half-brother, so it was his sister, stepsister. So he married his stepsister and his niece. And John the Baptist said, that's wrong. And it made Herodias so mad that when Salome, Herodias' daughter, danced before these crude, drunken men, and they got so turned on that he said, of his daughter, stepdaughter, you can have anything you want, honey. You're so beautiful. And she asked for the head of John the Baptist on the platter, and so he sold out. The, he had a reservation about that man. He knew that man was right. But because of a young teenage dancer, he chopped the head of this prophet off. But guess what? He couldn't have had the head of John the Baptist removed if God hadn't had a plan. It was time for John to go to heaven. Light was still shining. Antipas was the ruler over Galilee during Jesus' lifetime. And he was a wicked man. But he didn't stop the gospel from coming. And he didn't stop the kingdom from going forward. Jesus outlived him and Jesus outshined him. And then there was the ruler of rulers at that time, Tiberius Caesar. And I can't even share with you his life. I'm going to try to be discreet here. We don't have kids here so I can be a little bit more blunt than normal, but uh, Tiberius Caesar, as described by the historian Suetonius, when he retired to Capri, it is said that he devised uh, a lot of ways to have secret orgies, and he would get teams of people from both sexes, and they would be asked to do deviant sexual acts there in the palace, uh, you know, three and four together, all doing all kinds of stuff, orgies. So he could, they could sit around, drink, and watch this thing, kind of like, you know, watching cable TV. It's, his bedrooms were very spacious, and they had very salacious paintings and sculptors all around. And then he had an erotic library just in case people didn't know what he wanted them to do. He'd send them to the library so they could figure out what to do. He had kind of a woods, a garden, where he'd have little niches and he would have boys and girls to dress up like the Greek nymphs and pans, you know, like they look half animal, half animal and half man. And, and then there would be sexual things that went on there. And in fact, uh, he, would, he would get in a, a swimming pool and he would have a bunch of little boys get in there with him and they would do all kinds of stuff. Uh, he, he did things with babies. He was the sickest of the sickest of the sick and he was in the White House. He was at the top of the heap. He ran the, the known world. Jesus could have complained, how is it that the mighty, uh, the, the wicked have money? How is it the wicked have power? Us poor little apostolics, we don't even have a building. We don't even have a place to lay our heads. But look at that rich Tiberius. He's got all kinds of money and, and he rapes women. In fact, he raped one lady and she, she, well, he tried to rape her and she wouldn't do it. She left and stabbed herself, committed suicide. Ugly, ugly, ugly stuff. And, and no one's going to take Tiberius Caesar to court. He got away with it. As Christians, we can say, how is it that they can do those wicked things and get away with it? How is it that our courts are unjust? How is it that the policemen aren't doing what they're supposed to do? How is it that the schools are not doing? And we can say, it's dark, it's dark. How horrible it is, it's dark. What are we going to do? This is a bad world. Let's just, 
hopefully survive until Jesus comes, or we can say, this is where the, the gospel came and changed everything. This is where the church was born. This is the kind of environment that goodness can thrive in. This is where darkness is brightest because of, I mean, light is brightest because of the darkness that's around. You and I have the privilege of being a shining light, a city set on a hill. America was that in the world for a while, but America got too big for its britches and threw God out of school and made us quit praying and junk like that. And, and I, I hurt for America and I grieve for America, but I don't live in grieving and I don't live in hurt and I don't live in depression because I'm part of something bigger than America. I'm part of something bigger than education or science I, I, I have the God of the universe who breathed something into me and I've chosen to be a part of his kingdom forever and ever when I repent that's me saying I want to go that way into that kingdom when I'm baptized in Jesus name I'm saying you know what in order to get in there I can't have sin in my life so I'm going to go down in Jesus name and when I come up my sins are going to be forgiven because I want to be a part of this kingdom of light when He fills me with the Spirit, He's given me fuel. He's given me oil. He's given me energy so I can burn. I am, I am one with God. He is in me and I am in Him. It, it's, like, it's like my personality is the filament. And the body that I am is the glass globe. And the power comes from the Almighty. When He comes into my life, He lights me up. And if my bulb is not all hidden and dirty, there's light that starts to shine. It's not really me. It's Him that shines. I, I can't be good unless He helps me good. I can't be nice to people unless He helps me be nice. But instead of me just keeping my bulb off, instead of me turning the electricity off, saying it's dark, I need to turn that light. I need to flow. I need to let God flow through me. Hallelujah. Shine brightly. Would you stand? Hallelujah. Jesus is that shining light. Yes. Right now, Mark Zammy is going to get ready to get baptized. God's going to change his life right here today. So as they get ready, I want to invite the rest of you to the altar. We're going to rejoice in a few minutes when they baptize him. But I want to I bring this to a close and ask you to think about a few things. Jesus is that shining light. We're in Him and He's in us. So, we're that shining light. I want to read three more scriptures. The first one is John chapter 12, verse 35, from the New Living Translation. Jesus, in fact, would you read this with me aloud together? Jesus replied, My light will shine for you just a little longer Walk in the light while you can, so the darkness will not overtake you. Those who walk in the darkness cannot see where they are going. Now let's go to John 12, 46. Read this with me too together if you would. I have come as a light to shine in this dark world, so that all who put their trust in me will no longer remain in the dark. And then one more, Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Loud together. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Let me summarize it like this. I've got four pieces of advice. Number one, don't fight the darkness. Don't try to control evil. Don't try to control people who want to be evil. Don't put your hope in the reformation of America. Pray for the reformation of America, but don't let your joy depend on whether America does the right thing. Because you're now hostage to somebody else's choice. Our job is not to fight the darkness. Our job is not to picket evil people. Sometimes we'll call attention to it. I'm not saying there's never a place for a, a life, a life 
what they call those things where they held hands and never called attention to abortion. But our main job is not to fight the political ills. Our main job is not to fight the, the social ills. Our main job is to try to get a life into our neighbor's heart, to our family member's heart. Second thing, the first one was don't fight the darkness. The second thing is don't fear the darkness. Fear is one of the enemy's favorite tap tactics. Even blood bought, Jesus' name, Holy Ghost filled people, if they give, away, give way to the fear instead of love, they can become depressed, discouraged, overwhelmed. If, if we fear, we put a wet blanket. Fear is a way to put our light under a bushel. It's the exact opposite of what we need to do. If it's dark out there, I don't go look for a bushel. If it's dark out there, I take the bushel off. That's the solution. I, I'm going to be concerned about everybody who falls away because I love them. But I'm not going to let my joy come from how many people decide to stay. People who don't listen to the counsel I give them from Scripture, I, my heart is heavy every time they leave. But I can't really afford to grieve and stay grieved for everybody who leaves here. I have to be a light. I care about them. I'll reach. I give my life. I'll go uh, mo most of the time by the time someone's left here especially if they've been here a while. I've spent hours in prayer and I've spent hours in counsel and I've reached for them. But you know what? If they say, see ya, I grieve for them and I pray for them. But my joy cannot be tied to their choice because they didn't put the light out. They just walked away from the light. I still have the light. I don't care how many people leave. I don't care if, the whole, if everybody has to go underground and I don't even know two other believers in the world, I still have the light. And thirdly, let His light shine. Every day when I get up and worship Him, I'm, I'm getting perspective. Every time I say, Jesus, you're good, that's perspective. Every time I say, Jesus, you're lovely, I, I'm focusing on light, not darkness. Every time I say, God, you're so merciful and kind and thank you for your goodness and thank you for your blessings. Every time I move into a time of worship in my own personal prayer time, I'm, I'm focusing on the light instead of the darkness. Every time I, I do what Brian encourages us to do today and try to open up, you know, I feel like closing down because the world's so heavy. I don't feel like throwing my hands in the air and say, God is good when the Supreme Court just did what it did. When an election goes a certain way and it looks like the world's getting in worse shape, it's really hard to say, hallelujah, but that's what I need to do right then. I need to say, hallelujah. I need to say, God is good. I need to say, doesn't matter if Herod's there. Doesn't matter if Annas is there. Doesn't matter if Caiaphas is in control. Doesn't matter if Tiberius is doing things that he shouldn't do. I still have uh, this well that can spring up inside of me. I still have this source of power that can flow through me. I can still be a light today. The darkness will not put this out. The darkness cannot ever distinguish, extinguish this light. Only I can do that. I can be hated of all men for righteousness, but I can have joy. Why? Because they can't put this light out. They could put my natural light out. They could hang me. They could behead me. And by the way, there, uh, there's uh, right now uh, a new market. Uh, uh, someone sent me a clipping from somewhere. Uh, they're starting to make uh, guillotines. For beheadings. Revelation talks about those saints in the last days who lost their heads. And 20 years ago, we all thought, oh, that's just a figure of speech, but now we're seeing it happen before our very eyes. They can put my head on a guillotine, but if I don't allow them to be my influence, I can lose my head and have joy and, and go right into glory. They can't put it out. They can't put it out. So, 
when he takes me home, I'm going to be leaving a dark world. It has a little bit of light, but I'm going to go into a place where the Bible says he is the light. There's no more sun there. It's a kingdom where his light is so bright, we don't even need a sun. So there's this God. He's all powerful. He's so bright. He's so, it, it, it would be like the sun and somebody thinking when they pull the shade down in their house that they put the sun out. No. You can, you can write a book that God is dead, but all you've done is pull the shade down in your little, little, tiny, little room that you live in. That God is still alive. Hallelujah. I wish I could keep attention like some people can keep attention. They're walking up here and going out in here. They're going to be baptized right now. So we'll just turn our attention here for just a minute. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> yeah. Mark's been, uh, uh, Mark has been reading the Word of God. He's reading through the Bible. And uh, Jeff went over and was witnessing to him. And uh, then they contacted me and uh, giving him a Bible study. And, he, and we saw what you know, how important baptism in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is. And Mark said he wanted to be baptized. You want to say a few words, Mark? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his namesake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life, life long. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Mark Zamba, according to the confession of your faith. And in obedience to the word of God, I now baptize you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins.
I'd like to, to ask you to pray one more time here. The principle is this. If, if you have a light switch in your house and you know good and well that that switch would turn the light on, you still got to go turn the light on. So, so right now I just preach something to everybody here and you might have all said, yeah, I, I believe that. But that doesn't mean you turn the light on. So I'd like for you to think of the thing in your life that's heaviest right now. The thing in your life that's bugging you the most. The thing that some of you are probably even thinking, you know, if that wasn't there, I'd really have joy. If that one thing was different, I think my whole life would be different. But would you think of that one darkness, that one issue? And would you, as we sing this song or another song again, whichever they choose, I wonder if you would choose to focus not on the darkness, but on the light. Like if, for example, you have a sickness and in your mind, that's such a big deal. It's like, you know what? If I just didn't have that sickness, I could have joy. Well, I'd like for you to, as we sing this song, just worship God for being the great physician. Just thank God for being the many times he's already healed you. Just praise him for the dozen miracles that you remember that happened to people standing right here in this room right now. And turn the light on. God, you're the healer. Lord, you're, I don't know if you're going to heal me, and I think my life would be better if you did, but it doesn't matter if you heal me or not. You are the healer. I worship you because you are the healer. I worship you because you are the light. I, I'm good because light cannot be extinguished. So instead of looking at my disease, which seems to be dis extinguishing my light, I need to say, I don't know why that hasn't been healed yet. We, we need to pray for Sister Salmon's grandson. He was in a car accident, broke his back. He's paralyzed from the waist down. He's got his, his head's in a brace for, for fear that uh, he's had a back surgery and, and he, he shouldn't move around too much. Now he's got pneumonia. Well, like she said, uh, you know, that's, that's a horrible thing. They're telling him he's never going to walk again. Unless Jesus wouldn't do something about it. Now, I don't know if he will, but I know people he's done that for. So I don't focus on the bad situation. I focus on this God who's able to fix a bad situation or help someone deal with a bad situation. I'm not, I haven't figured it all out. It's not all easy. My answer is not... Say three Hail Marys and you'll be healed. My answer is, He is your source. He is the light. You can be happy that He's the light on your last day. You can, in your last breath, have joy because Jesus is the light. He breathed life, eternal life into you. And if He chooses to let you die of cancer or a cold, it doesn't matter. A car accident, it doesn't matter. He's God. I, I rejoice in who He is, not in how it's looking for me right now. If there's a sin in your life that's a dark thing, it's a besetting sin, it's, it's destroying you, instead of fighting the sin, turn the forgiveness on. Turn, turn to Him and say, God, let it flow. I don't deserve to talk in tongues, but fill me with your spirit so I talk in tongues again. I don't deserve to have joy today, but would you forgive me so I can forgive myself, so I can have joy again? And, and don't try to fix your inadequacies and don't try to get perfect so you can be happy. Turn to the source and, and, and open the gates of heaven that way. Open that power source into your life, as was said. And again, I'll say these songs and what Brian said and, and the scripture, I'm not... This isn't Hanson's thing today. This is what God is saying to you right now. So we need to write. You've got a few minutes right now. You can choose. You can leave here dark. You can leave here depressed. You can leave here overwhelmed by the world. Or you can leave here rejoicing that you have this light source. And that nothing can extinguish it. Would you rejoice right now? Don't repent. Rejoice. God is good. God is good.